protests and violence are once again rippling throughout the Middle East. This time, an anti-Islamic film is part of the cause. What started as a YouTube trailer has now resulted in the death of US diplomats, including an ambassador, and waves of protests across Muslim-majority countries, mainly in the Middle East region. To us, to me personally, this video is disgusting and reprehensible. It appears to have a deeply cynical purpose to denigrate a great religion and to provoke rage. I've made it clear that the United States has a profound respect for people of all faiths. We stand for religious freedom and we reject the denigration of any religion, including Islam. While some analysts believe that the attack on the US Embassy in Libya was a result of more than just the anti-Islamic film, much of the focus of the protests have continued to focus on the film's overt insult to the religion. This new wave of protests adds to many other smoldering issues that have continued to impact the Middle East region in recent times. Tonight on Global Perspectives, we bring you an exclusive interview with someone who has intimate knowledge of the region. As the former head of the Al Jazeera network, Wada Kanfa, transformed the way the world saw the Middle East. In conversation with Global Perspectives during his recent visit to Colombo, Mr. Kamfa presented an alternative perspective about a number of critical conflicts, including Syria, Israel and Palestine, and Iran. I think the nuclear threat of Iran is very much exaggerated. And I do think that the Western powers and Israel in particular have exaggerated this threat to a large extent, and I do not share the same concern. Neither most of the Arab world. That's what's ahead on Global Perspectives tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us for another episode of Global Perspectives. Tonight we have a special show for you as we bring you an exclusive interview with the former top executive of the Al Jazeera network, Mr. Wada Kamfar. Last year, as Mr. Kamfar resigned from the network after eight years, he was named one of the top global thinkers by Foreign Policy magazine for transforming Al Jazeera into the most influential media source in the Middle East. During a brief visit to Sri Lanka, Mr. Kamfar sat down with Global Perspectives for an in-depth discussion on a number of issues in the Middle East. The main reason for Mr. Wada Kamfar's visit to Colombo was to deliver the commemoration lecture of the Bakir Marka Center for National Unity. At that lecture, the former Director General of the Al Jazeera Network spoke about what is now commonly referred to as the Arab Spring. His lecture was titled, Arab Awakening, Birth of a New Political Paradigm. We know that the West has established within it great civilization based on participation and political democracy and so on and so forth. When it came to Middle East, we have seen the worst and the most ugly face of Western dominance and hegemony. Later, Mr. Kamfar spoke at the press club event at the Sri Lanka Press Institute. There, he talked about media, ethics and good governance. Mr. Kamfar shared his experiences running Al Jazeera in the midst of threats, trying to protect its journalists and what kind of an impact journalists and the media can and should have on democracy. But the worst form of journalism is journalism that is, deceives the public. We found that Mr. George Bush was actually planning to hit and destroy our headquarters in Dawhadistan. And that was the discussion that took place between George Bush and Tony Blair. In 2004, that was the major story that we did cover. It was leaked to us by some good people inside 10 Downing Street who have seen a memorandum and they decided that this is too bad to be hidden. So they leaked it to the Daily Mirror and from the Daily Mirror, of course, we picked it up and it became something that the international media start talking about. Mr. Kangfa served as the head of the Al Jazeera satellite network during a tumultuous time in the Middle East that included the overthrow of the former Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak, the ongoing nuclear threat from Iran, increasing tensions between Israel and Palestine and the violence in Gaza. Oftentimes, it was only Al Jazeera that was able to report from the ground. We begin our interview tonight with Mr. Kamfer by talking to him about one of the most contentious conflicts in the Middle East right now, and that's Syria. Mr. Kamfer talks about sectarian violence and some of the misconceptions that the rest of the world has about the conflict. 
I want to start by perhaps talking about one of the most pressing issues um, in the Middle East right now, which is Syria, which you touched upon on your speech earlier today as well. Um, I read a recent article that started with the phrase saying, what is President Assad thinking? And I was wondering if you could help us understand outside the region what he really must be thinking as this uh, crisis escalates almost to no end. You see, Anurad, I think the, the problem of most of our leaders in the Middle East uh, that they are detached from their people, detached from their reality. They are living in their own virtual, their own realm, which is completely far and distant from what actually things are happening on the ground. I think Al-Assad himself is right now in a very deep crisis. He continues to dismiss what is happening in his, in his country as a conspiracy by the West and by uh, regional powers trying to uh, bring down a regime that he claims that was the center of access for resistance. In my opinion, uh, this regime has been for four decades oppressing the public. Although this regime was part of an axis that was used to call itself the axis of resistance, but that was never a justification to oppress the public. Those who would like to struggle against injustice wherever it is, they cannot do that by oppressing their, their public. And this is what the regime, the regime now is losing on a daily basis, and the revolution is winning also on a daily basis. But unfortunately, there is a lot of chaos taking place in the region. There is very much of loud voices going around about the revolution without really presenting solid uh, assistance and help to the, to the, to the rebels uh, and to the revolution itself, uh, neither from the Americans or the Europeans or even the re neighboring countries who are very reluctant to really um, give uh, support uh, and considerable support and the quality arms to the rebels. But don't you think that, that they're facing this conflict as we do, and we saw it here in Sri Lanka, you know, is it rebels, is it uh, terrorists, is it, uh, you know, uh, revolutionists, and they're, I mean, how does that fit in? Because I've seen both sides saying it's good to arm the rebels and help this movement, then again, some people say, you know, we've tried this before and has failed in other parts of the world, so is it a good idea? What is your that comment a, to that? A revolution, a mass revolution against a dictatorship that has started a peaceful one for eight months Nothing, actually, not even a stone was thrown from the people against the, uh, the army. But unfortunately, when the killing started amongst the civilians and the brutality of what we have seen during the last few months was immense, people from within the army split away and started to defend their people, to defend their villages and their towns. And I do think that what we see right now in Syria is not like what you have seen here in Sri Lanka, what we have seen in many other countries uh, in the world. What we see right now is mass revolution where almost everyone is involved in. And I think the more we are allowing this regime to continue killing the people, the more that we are fragmenting this region and creating scenarios that might have severe consequences, not only in Syria, but also the future of the region altogether. In your talk, you also mentioned how the media, uh, we tend to you know, not include historical context, we have very short-term memory and so forth. Can you tell us one major misconception that people outside the region have about uh, Syria and what's happening there? I think a lot of people, while I'm traveling, are concerned about the issue of sectarianism in Syria, as if what we see right now is a revolution from the Sunni Muslim majority against the Alawi Muslim uh, minority. It is not really true. I think the revolution started as a public movement across the spectrum against a, t a, a dictatorship. And this dictatorship, it is true that they are depending on the Alawite minority, but the Alawite minority itself was a brust by it. So this revolution is wise. And this revolution is depending on a collective knowledge of the society towards its identity and the fact that Syria is a mosaic of cultures and religions. So I would not at all, you know, uh, um, recommend this kind of, of, of analysis that it is a sectarian uh, issue. Also, beside that, what's happening in Syria is not a result of foreign intervention, that the capitals of the West are plotting against the regime of, 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 of Bashar Assad. I don't think so. I think the capitals of the West are even worried about the collapse of the regime and what could happen in this, in, in this case. So I think what's happening continues to be an organic, natural, planned, that went from within the 
Syrian soil, and I hope that it will soon accomplish its target without further bloodshed in this country. Born in Palestine, Mr. Kamfar has a diverse academic background. His postgraduate studies have focused on philosophy, African studies, and international politics. During his nearly decade-long tenure at Al Jazeera, he covered the world hotspots such as South Africa, Iraq, and Afghanistan. In this second segment, the conversation turns into Israel-Palestine conflict. Let's move from one area in the Middle East, seeing protests to another, one that I know is close to your heart, the Palestinian regions. Um, we've been seeing reports over and over again, they're uh, protesting against the high cost of living, government is, isn't able to pay salaries and so forth, and President Abbas himself has called it a Palestinian spring. Do you see it in that way? I mean, are we going to see the same type of things coming from uh, Palestine as we did uh, a year or so ago? Now, of course, we have something in Palestine, which is, might be different from the case of, of Syria and the case of Egypt and Tunisia, which is the occupation. So although this Palestinian National Authority claims certain kind of presence in certain territories, but every one of us knows that the utmost control over the land is in the hand of the Israelis. The security is in the hand of the Israelis. The borders are in the hand of the Israelis. So I think that the presence of the Palestinian National Authority at this stage is a threatened not only because of certain kind of technicalities, but the sole existence of it is losing its justification. And this entity has existed in order to achieve certain kind of demands for the Palestinians. And I think at this stage, with the deadlock about the two-state solution uh, and the negotiations and the collapse of this whole theory, which I feel is not going to achieve its target um, in the near future, the Palestinian National Authority existence is a threatened, and maybe people start to question whether we should continue to have Palestinian National Authority without powers and without control on any territory and without proper really service to the public. What is the use of having an entity like that? Well, it's good that you brought that point out because I was just going to ask you about earlier this year, um, one of the architects of the Oslo Peace Accord made that statement, in, in fact saying, you know, may it, the peace process isn't working, maybe you need to dissolve the Palestinian Authority and just hand everything back to Israel and say, here, take care of the people. I mean, isn't that, is that what you're sort of getting at? I mean, saying that there is no cause for the Palestinian Authority anymore? I think the Palestinians are not now in front of a great test of whether they would like this struggle to continue on foundations that correct the mistakes that they have done during the last few years. I think the theory itself needs to be revisited. The two-state solution itself needs to be revisited. This is not taking us anywhere. And this perpetual concentration on a process of negotiations is helpful maybe to serve for certain political gains and aims but not helpful to resolve this historical conflict that we are experiencing. I do believe that we need a new imagination within the Palestinian sphere, and also we need a new imagination of where are we heading as far as our relationship as Palestinians and Arabs with Israel itself. So when you say rethink the two-state solution, are you saying it should be put aside and maybe new things? This is what I'm saying. I mean, the two-state solution based on the parameters that have been mm -hmm. promoted during the last two decades are not actually working. And uh, now the, the Israelis, of course, are not making it uh, happen. But also, at the same time, I would, you know, really question whether two-state solution without refugees and without proper integrity of land between Uzbek and Gaza can really create stability and durable peace as uh, the, gain, uh, the aim is. I do believe that, you know, we are for decades now negotiating divorce as Palestinians and Israelis, and uh, we are not going anywhere. We are not really succeeding. And I always say, I was in South Africa, and I have seen how the South, Africa's, uh, the South, Africa, uh, South Africans negotiated marriage, and they succeed. I have been uh, last week in South Africa, I've seen that the country is still stable, prosperous, and thriving.